So, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the European Parliament Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, I'm very happy to welcome you to today's event on CBAM. Um, this is, of course, a very timely discussion uh, in the context of the European Green Deal and the Fit for 55 package uh, specifically. So, um, as I'm sure you're all uh, aware, this legislation will play a decisive role. Uh, when it comes to strengthening industrial decarbonization, uh, yet some of its key parameters are uh, still to be defined. As a result, before we kick off today's discussion, I would like to take the opportunity to thank uh, MEP Ms. Maria Spiraki for hosting this event, uh, but also colleagues from SEMBIRO for kindly co-organizing this webinar. Um, and then prior to passing the floor to Ms. Spiraki for her opening remarks, I would just like to provide, uh, to provide you with some housekeeping rules and specifically to invite participants to send us your questions during the event. For that, you can use the Q&A's box of the platform uh, that should appear uh, at the right hand of your screen, choosing the All Panelists option. Uh, within your question, please make sure to also uh, note the speaker to whom your question is best addressed, so that on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, we can facilitate a fruitful discussion to follow. Once again, thank you all for joining us today. And now, without further ado, uh, the floor belongs to Ms. Piraki, co-chair of the European Parliament Intergroup and host of today's online event. Thank you, Elias. First of all, I would like to welcome everyone today on this discussion with regards to the impact of the CBAM proposal on industrial decarbonization and its impacts on business and industry in the EU. Concerning the event, I think the timing is ideal because the negotiations are currently taking place and it could be interesting to hear from our rapporteur, my colleague Mohamed Sehim, who is present here with us, on the progress that has been performed over the file. Before turning to our guest, allow me to share a few thoughts about CBAM and why it is important to set the proposal in a multi-acceptable framework. CBAM, as proposed by the Commission, is towards the right direction, according to my opinion, as it is aligned with the EU's tradition in being a pioneer in setting global standards, especially on environmental and climate policy. It shows in practice that the Union is taking drastic measures to reduce the carbon footprint of industry, encouraging at the same time the adoption of green and renewable energy sources. But it's not only that. Especially through CBAM, the EU aims to push for the decarbonization of industry beyond the European Union. It is an effort to level the global competitive field without reverting to protectionism. As you all know, Parliament drafted its own initiative report prior to the Commission's proposal. And in this report, which is called Towards a WTO Compatible EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism, it was a mini report, we as Parliament highlighted the problem that the implementation of the proposal might have, especially in terms of exports to third countries. Therefore, I would like to express my concern about the fact that the Commission's final proposal has not considered Parliament's proposal on many issues. And this is a gap that we need to bridge on the state of working on compromise amendments. And there is an obvious need, as you can see, for the CBAM to be an instrument for preventing carbon leakage through a fair mechanism for imports. But at the same time, it is also an opportunity to encourage third countries to implement similar carbon prices mechanism while pushing them also towards the path of decarbonization. That's why we have to use at scale innovative financial instrument and innovative financing mechanism for the decarbonization for our European industry. And an example is the carbon contracts for difference. Most importantly, the Parliament in the INI report I have already mentioned highlights in order to foresee them to be successful, but free allocations must remain until we have ensured that the mechanism is functional. When it comes to Mohamed Sakim report, which is now under negotiation between the political groups in order to conclude compromises acceptable from a wide majority, and I'm quite sure that Mohamed is working to this direction, there are three points I would like to focus on. The first one is the point of widening the scope of the mechanism. The CBAM would initially apply, as we all know, to, to imports in five emission incentive sectors deemed at great risks for carbon leakage, and this is cement, iron and steel, aluminium, fertilizers, and electricity. Our rapporteur, our colleague Mohamed Sahim, refers to the need for the mechanism to cover also organic chemicals, hydrogen and polymers, 
as well as indirect emissions, the CBAM is covering only direct emissions, in all sectors covered by the CBAM, meaning that he is broadening the scope. In principle, I think that as long as we have not validated the mechanism of computability from the WTO's level, it is of high risk to widening its scopes in terms of its implementation. According to my opinion, in the amendments we table as CPP, the mechanism should enter into force gradually in two stages, between 2023 and 2025, and between 2026 and 2030, a second total transitional period. During the second period, the allocation of free rights should remain in effect, and it is a key issue, for, according to our opinion. Last, and this, this is a point that I'm taking into consideration, was to do with the creation of a central CBAM authority, although it is a proposal that has been widely discussed, and I think it is also supported by, member, by, by, by many political groups. I think that we have to be very considerate about the circumstances that apply to every and each member state in a proportionate way, and it is very, very important for us to take into account. We are in a very critical moment for the implementation of CBAM. We need a wide, acceptable compromise approach in order to address industry's concern, while at the same time we safeguard the targets down the way to decarbonization. So we must not therefore undermine the different circumstances in each member state regarding to their proximity to third countries. It is a specific interest for me. I come from Greece, and it is important to understand that it is a totally different situation to have in the neighborhood, the Netherlands, uh, maybe Germany, France, or uh, the others, and it is totally different to have uh, Albania and Turkey. It is important to say that we have to maintain the competitiveness of our industry by facilitating all sectors involved to accelerate it, of course, their green and digital transition especially by taking advantage of the recent state aid guidelines, which are in the pipeline on energy and climate, and the new Repower EU toolkit, which the Commission has already published last week. The industry needs to step up with innovative solutions in order to accelerate its transformation. Our strategic autonomy for the European Union is of paramount importance into the newly established context that has been created after the Russian invasion in Ukraine. We need to lead by example, without undermining our position as the biggest integrated market in the globe. Once again, I would like to thank you all for being here with us and looking forward for our fruitful dialogue. And of course, after the, the presentation of our co-organizer, the, the representative of SEM Bureau, our reporter, Mohamed Sahim, will take the floor. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Piraki, for your welcome remarks and also for uh, setting the scene with regards to the discussion to follow. And uh, on this note, I'm happy to provide the floor to Mr. Kopenhole. Uh, Mr. Kuhn Kopenhole is the CEO of the European Cement Association, SEMBIRO, uh, has held this position for, uh, for a decade, representing the cement industry inside the EU institutions and also with other public authorities. Uh, Mr. Kopenhole has uh, also been working in the field of uh, European affairs and uh, European law since 19 uh, 1988. Uh, so, Mr. Kopenhole, it's with great pleasure uh, welcoming you today. Uh, so, the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you very much. And let me first of all um, thank you uh, for your efforts in organizing this meeting, organizing the speakers. Um, welcome to all the speakers. Thank you, Mrs. Piraki, for um, hosting and co hosting this event. Uh, Mr. Shahim, very pleased to see you today. Um, this is going to be an important debate in the European Parliament going forward, as we all know. So, thank you for all that. Um, I do want to start my uh, intervention by a brief um, word about the situation in Ukraine. Uh, I think we all express our support to the people in Ukraine in, in these times of human suffering. Um, we do see a glimmer of hope in the solidarity that is displayed by all the European citizens in providing shelter, uh, foods, the basic needs for these people uh, who are fleeing Ukraine. We have a cooperation agreement with the Cement Association in Ukraine. Uh, and the companies there are very actively engaged in making sure that they can help the people in the country. Um, I must say that we've been impressed also by the position taken by the European institutions, including by the European Parliament, um, on this conflict. So um, thank you for that. Um, when we're moving into the discussion on the CBAM, um, 
First of all, I think it's important to embed the CBAM into the larger Green Deal. This is not a on itself own standing uh, initiative. This is part of the Green Deal. It's part of the initiatives to decarbonize Europe. Um, and indeed, as Ms. Spiraki said, the intention of the CBAM is to incentivize third countries to reduce their emissions. That's the main incentive. Of course, the flip side of that is as long as that is not happening, then there is a situation where we need to look at this second leg of carbon leakage. The, third, the first leg being the risk of relocation. The second leg is that we need to address the imports into Europe of carbon intensive products. And that's indeed where the CBAM comes in. Uh, but that is an important context because the objective of the CBAM, in our view, is the CO2 cost equalization between European producers and third country producers. Not less, and we will come back to the conditions, but also not more. We're not seeking protection. We're, even not, we're certainly not seeking double protection. This is about CO2 cost equalization with third countries. And why do we need that? Um, two main reasons, actually. I mean, first of all, when we look at our own industry, um, we see a surge of imports into the European Union, a 120% increase in imports over the past five years, 25% uh, increase in 2020 compared to 2019, and in the first months of 2021, even a 37% increase in imports. With changing business models, uh, business models whereby the most intensive part of the production, clinker production, is happening outside of Europe and then is brought into Europe to be ground in cement. These are important developments uh, that are affecting the European economy and European industry. Second reason is that we are, uh, we are in need of building the business case for decarbonization. We need large investments. We have our roadmap as Sembiro, as the cement industry. Also, our companies have the roadmaps, and we had indeed interesting discussions with Mr. Shahim around innovation in our sector. Um, you will see on our website 53 projects that we have published, mostly in breakthrough technologies. Um, these can then be replicated when they are successful across the European Union. Um, we have two thirds of the global uh, carbon uh, capture and use projects that are located in Europe. The best performers in Europe are basically uh, better than the best performers in any country around the world. Um, we have an innovation agenda um, for the cement industry that is largely initiated also in the research center for cement that is based in Dusseldorf in Europe. So we have the research in Europe that starts in the European Cement and Research Academy. Um, so I think all these elements together mean that we are indeed on track um, for innovation, on track to invest even in the current circumstances where indeed the increasing energy prices um, are putting an enormous strain on the competitiveness of our industry. And as we all know, the energy demand and energy needs will only decrease, de uh, increase sorry, in the decarbonization agenda. But still, um, I think coming back to the CBAM, CO2 cost equalization is key. And then I would like to end by um, looking at the design um, and in fact also concurring with what Mrs. Spiraki said, um, the CBAM needs to be well designed to achieve that CO2 cost equalization. Um, and then there are three points that I would like to mention. First of all, we need a watertight CBAM. Uh, we need to look at how emissions in third countries are assessed um, to make sure that there is a comparability. We need to avoid circumvention. In terms of coverage, we need to make sure that direct and indirect emissions are included. And we need to make sure that when there is an equivalency assessment of a third country regime, that is indeed happening uh, on the basis of a CO2 pricing mechanism requirement that is in place. Um, I'm pleased to see that quite a lot of these elements are already taken up in the report and in the, sorry, in the amendments of Mr. Shaheen. Um, so I think that's a positive development. On the phase out of free allowances and the um, CBAM introduction, uh, I do think, and I concur again with Mrs. Spiraki, that we need to have a uh, realistic approach. A realistic approach in the sense that we need to make sure that the CBAM demonstrates its full effectiveness before we start uh, talking about the phase out of the free allowances. Again, cost equalization is equal, uh, is essential. Uh, when we're talking about equal treatment, it's not only equal treatment with third countries, but it's also equal treatment with other ETS uh, industries within the European Union. If I may uh, briefly refer to the um, Arcelor Atlantique judgment of 2008 of the European Court of Justice, the European Court was saying that you can introduce a step-by-step -step approach by introducing some sectors in ETS and not all sectors, but that doesn't dispense the legislator 
from uh, basing itself on objective criteria and taking into account technical and scientific information. That is not different in assessing the CBAM. Before we make sure that the CBAM is introduced to sectors, we need to make sure it is effective. Before we start reducing free allowances, we need to make sure it is fully effective. Um, otherwise, the sectors in the CBAM are being used as guinea pigs without any consideration to their competitive situation regarding the other ETS sectors. And the last point I would like to make, but that will be subject to the debate, I guess, um, is the whole situation around exports. Um, as Ms. Spiraki also said, I think that needs a solution. Um, we haven't at this stage um, seen any valid counter argument to the legal opinions that we have, which set out uh, the conditions under which such a export solution can be considered compatible with WTO rules. So I think these are the essential elements for us to have a watertight uh, CBAM. And I hope with that I've given a sort of start starting point um, for the discussion. So thank you very much for having the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kopenhole, uh, for highlighting the importance, but also the time, uh, timely nature of uh, today's debate. Uh, so, having heard from MEP Ms. Piraki, but also Mr. Uh, Kopenhole, I'm very happy to introduce you our excellent set of panelists for today, starting with MEP Mr. Shahim, who is a member of the European Parliament from the Netherlands for the group of Socialists and Democrats. Uh, Mr. Shahim is uh, also the rapporteur, of course, uh, on the CBAM file within the ENVI Committee, and within the EP Intergroup, he is also the co-chair of the Working Group on Circular Economy. Uh, so, good morning, Mr. Shahim. Uh, then I'm happy to introduce Mr. Pasquale De Mico, uh, stepping in for Digitaxud. Uh, Mr. De Mico is a policy officer in the Commission's unit uh, in charge of the European Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism in the Directorate General for Taxation uh, and Custom Union. Then we have uh, Mr. Panaras. Uh, Mr. Yanni Panaras is the Executive Director for European Operations and Sustainability at Titan Cement Group. Uh, previously, Mr. Panaras uh, also chaired the SEV Corporate Sustainability Council and held uh, senior management positions at SNB Industrial Minerals Group. Uh, of course, we also have with us today Mr. Marco Mensing, who is the Director General of CEFIC. Uh, good morning, Mr. Mensing. Uh, CEFIC, of course, uh, is the European Chemical Industry Council, and as part of his role, Mr. Mensing shapes the strategy and direction of the European chemical industry. Then we also have with us Mr. Nick Keramidas, uh, who is the EU and Regulatory Affairs Director at Mitil Neos, a leading global industrial and energy company. Uh, we also have uh, Ms. Uh, Joanna Lene, uh, who is the Senior Policy Advisor at E3G, an independent climate change think tank. Uh, Ms. Lene uh, therefore works very closely with NGO partners, industrial stakeholders and policymakers on issues relating to decarbonizing industrial sectors. And last but not least, we also have Mr. Benjamin Dennis, uh, who works as a Senior Policy Advisor for Industrial Europe, the Federation of European Trade Unions in Manufacturing, uh, Mining, and energy sector. And apologies if I'm running uh, a little bit fast, but I just noticed that uh, we're uh, 10 minutes late uh, into our discussion. So I want to make sure that we address uh, all of our questions and we just um, uh, deliver on the um, uh, expectations of the audience as well. So uh, starting with Mr. Shahim, if I may, um, it is with great pleasure to welcome you uh, to our event at the moment that I think um, all of today's attendees and speakers are very much uh, waiting for. So thank you for your availability as it is an honor having you uh, specifically as the leader rapporteur of the European Parliament on the file. Uh, I'm also aware that you would have to leave uh, just after the panel discussion. So I'm keeping this in mind regarding time management. Yeah, that's why um, I think I, I want to be short, but it, it, yeah, sorry, sorry, continue. Um, then diving into the discussion then, I think that to begin with it would be very interesting uh, to take us through the main points of your report, uh, presenting us your vision and your perspective also on CBAM. Yeah, I, I was thinking, eh? I mean, I think most people that uh, are, in the, are present today know the uh, main points of the report. Uh, maybe we can save some time there, Elias. Mm -hmm. Also, because we're currently working with the shadows to, uh, uh, we hopefully, I think, um, let's say by the end of next month, we have a position of parliament. I mean, then my report doesn't make any, I mean, there's no, that report will be the most important one. I mean, then my first draft is uh, not that important anymore. Uh, uh, so instead of going through all the changes that I wanted to say, let's, let's have an open debate. Let's have an open discussion on some of the elements I think that need to be discussed. And I think uh, say convention, an international standard on uh, carbon accounting, 
uh, what we can do on export rebates base or what we cannot do on export rebates. base. I think these are the interesting points. Instead of me using seven minutes explaining what I think, uh, what, I, what I presented in December. And uh, let me also say, some people in this panel, I see more than my wife for the last month. Uh, so we are continuously discussing and reaching out to each other, trying to understand each other's position. Um, uh, also, even sometimes we don't, we don't agree on everything, but I think that's the, the good point of doing politics in the EU. We always, there's always room to negotiate, there's always room to listen to each other's point, to understand each other's point, and then see how we can go, how we can move forward. So, if, I think we should have a debate with the panel on, you know, the, um, the design of the, of the CBAM, uh, the scope maybe, but I think, you know, the export rebates, is, export, what to do with exports, I mean, not necessarily export rebates, is a very important one. I also think that, you know, this international standard or trying to define something, how to calculate carbon, embedded carbon of products, how to set a standard, this, this is something I think very important. Also, uh, uh, seeing that other countries are also thinking about their own CBAM or CBA mechanisms. But again, I'm, I'm just a, 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 a guest in this panel, but I think having some debates on that would be better than me using seven minutes. Uh, 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 explaining what, what's in my report. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chahim. And I think indeed that uh, this is a very fresh uh, plot twist uh, that will add to the to the greater value of the event. Uh, if I just uh, may step in with a follow-up question to ask you, looking into the timeline of the file, what are currently the next steps of the discussion in the European Parliament? So we are having our shadow debates, and I must say they are they go quite well. Um, I think uh, the idea of CBAM is 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 it has a lot of support in the European Parliament. Of course, um, we do not always agree on the let's say the details, but we're getting there. I I expect I expect uh, that the timeline that we had, so a vote in Envy in in May, and then a vote in Penry in July will be will be uh, I think will be met I have no reason to think that's not uh, that will not be the case um, and I also that I also think that we will resolve the issues that are on the table uh, I think we will have a, a, a parliament position on on the um, on the um, on the scope on the um, what to do with exports etc I have, I have uh, I'm quite positive about those points I cannot go into much details. I can give you my position on them, but that doesn't mean that that will be the position of the parliament because that we have to distinguish some uh, a little bit. Eh? I'm, uh, mm -hmm. I, I mean. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chahim. So uh, it comes naturally following the discussion to ask you then, without jeopardizing, of course, the vision and ambition of CBAM, do you see any space for adjustments on specific topics? I mean, so in my report, I mean, I didn't touch upon all elements. I mean, exports is one of these issues. I think also the commission didn't uh, come with, with a solution there. I mean, and, and as I told many of you a lot of times, I, I understand and I understand the problem, but it's not easy to find a solution. Even in the case that the parliament comes with an idea, it still has to go through the council and it still has to be WTO compatible. I, I've heard four or five possible solutions and i think two of them could be acceptable uh, but most of them uh, i don't see them uh, uh, being accepted by the wto so you know any form of export rebates like direct subsidies on exports i don't see that being acceptable um accepting exports from ets or from c uh, you know is also i think goes against the, the idea of having a, car a carbon price. I think the solution that also the Commission is, I think, now looking at is looking at the Innovation Fund. This could be an interesting one. Uh, really working together with the export intense uh, 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 companies and see whether we can have a dedicated part of the Innovation Fund helping them decarbonize. That, that could be interesting. Um, we also have the current mechanisms within ETS where um, basically, uh, carbon intense, uh, um, sorry, uh, export intense uh, companies, if I'm not mistaken, uh, under certain conditions, get 100% of the benchmark. 
I mean, these are, this is something that exists within ETS. We will have to see how that then uh, how that 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 will work with 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 having a CBAM. And uh, but I mean, these are. I think the innovation fund is the best thing to do. Uh, uh, I, I, again, I know that the commission is looking into it, but maybe Mr. Pasquale D'Amico can can say some words there. Um, because also this fund is not in the hands of the parliament, um, but, but I think there it's, it's easiest uh, to, to look at what is needed to make our companies more uh, compatible, competitive compared to, to uh, let's say, third countries. Uh, but again, we are having talks about this. We are not there yet. Mm -hmm. uh, I know also there are groups in the European Parliament that want to have some kind of um, system where the best performers um, get like, a, 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 let's say, some kind of export support. Uh, but again, we're studying all the all the input of all the different political groups. At this stage, we do not know exactly what the landing zone will be of the parliament, uh, but know that uh, many political groups are really taking this very serious and are thinking about solutions. And then let's see whether they are WTO compatible. Uh, but this will, I think, in the next month or one and a half month, we will find the solution. And uh, but but for me personally, I rely a lot on the expertise uh, and the knowledge of the European Commission because um, yeah, and, and I know that they are they've listened to many people talking about exports and what to do with exports. And I know that I, I hope maybe Pascal, Mr. Demico, can say something on whether they are looking into it and what the. Uh, what do they think uh, could be a possible uh, outcome? Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chahim. And, uh, well, indeed, it is extremely important uh, to remain uh, solution oriented. Thank you very much for presenting us uh, your vision, but also the means uh, to strengthen the, the ambition, the climate ambition for CBOM, uh, its long term effectiveness. And we're also going to continue the discussion on, uh, on governance as well. Um, uh, maybe and... one, one comment, uh, one comment, because I know Mr. Copenhagen is from the cement industry. Yeah? And, uh, and uh, I think people have seen my position and, uh, and I try to explain uh, things there. Um, what, what will be a complex thing? Of, uh, I mean, it's not directly related to, see, to cement, but I know that cement is one of the sectors that is affected by it. Where there's a big difference between, let's say, the overall uh, carbon leakage or overall effects or, or, let's say, export intensity of a sector, if you look at the general uh, uh, numbers for the EU, and if you then distinguish between, let's say, uh, uh, the, 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 the border regions. I mean, this is something that, uh, that for some sectors, there is a difference between, let's say, exports and imports, if you look at the numbers in the EU. And if you compare that to, let's say, the countries that are directly uh, at the border of the EU, um, I mean, this is something that that uh, we have to see how uh, then CBAM affects those uh, countries. And I I've had a talk yesterday with Mr. Spiraki, oh, ma Madam Spiraki, my apologies. Um, uh, I mean, this is something we really have to study and to understand. And I think also the the transitional period can be used to, uh, to collect the right data to see. Uh, to see how we can uh, uh, how we can manage this. I mean, this is something I really want to wanted to stress and wanted to say here. For cement, for example, I mean, I can imagine if you live in in, in Romania or in Hungary or uh, that uh, that uh, uh, competitive like the com uh, competition with countries like Turkey will be much much severe. The same holds for Greek, uh, for Greece, etc. I mean, I wanted to say this because uh, this is something we are also thinking about uh, how to manage that. Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chahim. And actually, um, uh, your um, your contribution now just makes an excellent bridge uh, with a speaker to follow, Mr. Pasquale De Mico. Uh, so, Mr. De Mico, I would like to thank you very much for stepping in on behalf of Digitaxud in our panel discussion today. And well, the European Commission published its uh, CBAM proposal in July last year. Uh, could you please, uh, to begin with, give us your perspective on how CBAM can both help uh, to tackle carbon leakage, but also decarbonize European industries. Thank you so much for inviting and apologize from Elena Scopio, who couldn't join today. She's uh, my director and uh, she couldn't join for uh, health reasons. 
So first of all, thank you so much for uh, for uh, for being here, and thank you so much uh, for looking for a compromise because this is the main role of the parliament. And this is what we expect from uh, uh, Chahim, who's in charge with that, and uh, talking to all political forces. This is what we are doing now, talking to political forces and talking to the industry, because we need to strike a balance. So our proposal for the moment is suggesting the right balance. We were succeeding 10 years of entry into force together with the transitional period is 13 years, which is quite a long period. And we took that into account looking at the different needs. So the need to have a carbon leakage tackle immediately, tackle in the short term. We look at uh, uh, people who are more oriented to the climate protection and to people who are more oriented to the industry needs. So our proposal is balancing principle. But we are ready to look into different approach. So the Commission is here to dialogue. We are an honest broker. And what happened in the Parliament in the case of INTA, we hope it won't happen again. So all the responsibility now is upon you to strike a balance. We are ready to help. We are ready to be flexible. We are ready to find solutions. But there are also some red lines. But before going to the red lines, first of all, today is an important day. And maybe you know why. You know why? Uh, please uh, guide us through. <laughs> okay, you don't know why. Because a CBAM is discussed in the Council. Today, ECFIN will take a position on CBAM. It will happen around uh, uh, 12. It's public because it's a legislative file. So we will know today, maybe, what the position of the Council is. So we have two scenarios, that the Council reject the CBAM proposal made by the French Presidency, or the Council endorses it. In the first case scenario, all the uh, the weight of continuing the legislative work will be on the parliament until we go to trialogue. In the second, the two continues in parallel. But it's an important day because of that. So we may have a position of the council in few hours. Okay. So this is uh, this is very important. Now, uh, of the several proposals I saw circulating around, on some of them is uh, relatively easy to find solutions. And I mentioned the uh, the good ideas of Mep Chahim on circumvention and on the centralized authority. As you know, the Commission has proposed something completely different and for certain very solid and, uh, uh, and reasonable uh, uh, logic and reasons. We do not want a centralized authority because we don't know how to uh, finance that. The money coming from CBAM will come in the long run, and it is well possible that this money won't come at all because we offer third countries the possibility of taking the money for themselves. This is the, our suggestion in Article 9. So how to take into account carbon price paid abroad. The aim of CBAM is to be a climate measure, not a trade instrument. Okay. I come from a trade experience. I was in the WTO. I have more than 20 years of, uh, of work in trade policy. And I'm here to tackle the part of CBAM that is WTO oriented. CBAM is a climate instrument. So it's not uh, conceived to raise money. That's why if we don't know how much money are coming from, from CBAM, it's quite difficult to finance a centralized authority, but still the Commission is open. And if the Parliament and the Council prefer such a solutions, we will go for that solution. So now the file is in the hands of co-legislators. I repeat, we will deal as an honest broker. Openness to that, openness to strengthening circumvention, but there are a couple of red lines. And the red lines, Mr. Copenhagen know very well because we had frank and open discussions on that are on the export adjustment and on the double protection. So said, on export adjustment, we think that in the short term, there will be no problems for our export because export will be compensated by import substitution. In the long run, we will have enough time to introduce the uh, technical and the manufacturing changes that are needed, the investments otherwise. Matt Shahim mentioned the Innovation Fund, and the Innovation Fund will be key, will be crucial, will be topical in allowing our industry to decarbonize. So they will pay a bit more progressively with the phasing out of free allowances, and this money somehow will help to feed the Innovation Fund, and the Innovation Fund should help you on this road. What is very important here, and I should stress this point, is the trajectory should be clear. We are not dogmatic on the on the 10 years propose. You can propose more, you can propose less. Now it's in the hand of the parliament, it's in the hand of Mrs. Pirak, it's in the hand of Mr. Shaim. 
but we want to know that companies have a clear path in front of them. Otherwise, predictability is impossible. And without predictability, you cannot make investment. That's the logic. That's the logic. So adaptation can be long, but we cannot have at some point a decision that blocks CBAM forever. So CBAM should clearly enter into force. You decide when. And it is, this will be for the end game. And it's probably the most important point. In the end game, in the trialogue, I'm sure that we will find a solution. About the legal analysis of export rebate, please understand us. So we are relying on the best possible lawyers in the European Union who have defended the European Union in the WTO since its beginning. The same people that were in 1994 at the setup of the WTO have defended the European Union in all possible litigation. So if our chief litigators, and I mean the legal service of the European Commission, says that certain things can be done, other things cannot be done. And in particular, every mechanism that is contingent upon export risk falling under the definition of prohibit subsidy. And this is not a purely theoretical or legal definition. Please understand me. I've been in the WTO enough to confirm that the problem is not legal. The problem is economic because you risk to be countervailed the following day. Okay, so you give money back of CBAM to the cement industry, cement industry exports, cement industry is countervailed. So they will apply third countries the same tariff of what they perceive. Is it a good deal? No. Plus we saw what happened with the American trade wars in 2018 and 2019. Do we want to have other industry tackled by retaliation? I don't think so. So this is something that we cannot consider. The main problem, I repeat, is to have a clear trajectory. About having CBAM into force together with free allowances, we found the possible solution. And the solution is to have a step in and step out that go together in the same direction. But we cannot have CBAM without progressively reducing the free allowances. You can decide as much as you want, but repeat about the trajectory. This is very important for you. I recognize you can take them for 30 years, but remember one point that is very important. The more you take free allowances into force, the more you run risks because they have been defined as an actionable subsidy by the Americans in 2020. And there is an ongoing review, which was launched in January, and the review will be confirmed in short time. So this is not a safe instrument from a trade point of view, and is not a safe instrument from a climate point of view. And the climate point of view is in the hands of you, uh, MEP in, in, in Envy. So I think I, I tackled the points you asked me. Probably you ask uh, also about tackling carbon leakage and decarbonize European industry. Please understand that the objective of CBAM is not to decarbonize European industry, it's to decarbonize industry in third countries. For the carbonizing European industry, we have ETS, and you, honorable members, have the ETS in your hands, not as functionaires in, uh, in, in Taxut. We are in charge with the proposal of CIMA, and the proposal of CIMA wants simply to put third countries paying the same price. And it had, believe me, an incredible effect. We were literally shocked by this effect because many countries came to us, the main trade partners, and they said, we are ready to launch a carbon price system because they understand that CBAM had offered this uh, golden opportunity for them. Keep money from themselves. This is not what anti-dumping is offering. This is not what safeguards are offering. This is not what uh, countervailing instruments are offering. They can keep money for themselves. And several countries, including Turkey, including Russia before the war, including Ukraine before the war, they came with proposal, sound proposal, to tax with the system of uh, carbon price their uh, production. This is enormous, and it means that the effect of CBAM will be especially on third countries. This is what we want to achieve. This is what we will achieve. But together with you, I repeat, we are open. Come with some solutions. Let's discuss of solutions, and we will find solutions. The, the, the Commission is extremely open on that. But if you have a specific question, I'm ready to reply. And thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Domico. And of course, we will be uh, keeping a close eye for the council decision as well, uh, as you flagged around 12, which is just uh, right after our event. So a great momentum there. Uh, if I may just step in with regards to the external dimension of CBAM, um, how do you think it would then best support industrial decarbonization in the, con in the context of exports? When I said that uh, there are certain limits, but we can find other solutions. Okay. So first of all, from a legal point of view, what we cannot do is to grant money contingent upon export. But the, sol the best solution as suggested by uh, Map Shaheen is to find uh, green subsidies. So to help companies in decarbonizing. Now, from a, from a legal uh, point of view, we have just this limit. All the rest can be done uh, finding the appropriate ways. And I recognize also that products may have different needs because technology for decarbonizing cement are not the same than in steel. But what is important is that we help you, we guide you on this direction, and we try to avoid shock because we don't want the industry to suffer. We want to help the industry. CBAM is conceived to help the industry, but CBAM can only work with the ETS on the other hand. So we don't have control on the ETS as DG Taxud, but you have as members of the parliament. And CBAM is simply mirroring what happens in the ETS. So if on certain products on CBAM we have these 10 years, CBAM will go on 10 years. If you go for 15, it will go in 15. But this is the only possible solutions. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. D'Amico. And uh, turning to Mr. Panaras then, well, when it comes to the European Green Deal, uh, overall, many sectors and companies, including cement, uh, have voiced their ambition to reach carbon neutrality and reduce uh, their emissions. Yet, we see that uh, energy intensive industries face specific challenges related to decarbonization and carbon leakage. So, from your point of view, how could CBAM help you in tackling these and successfully decarbonize? Thank you, Elias. Thank you for the question, and uh, and thank you to the European Parliament and, and to Mrs. Spiraki for giving me the opportunity to to answer to participate in this panel. Actually, bringing a little bit of a different perspective from a, from an operator rather than from uh, from policy making, and I hope that that may may add some value to to the debate. Um, the the perspective is going to be from a cement company that is operating in in two countries at the edge of the EU. Uh, where we are most exposed to the effects of carbon leakage. I'm sure that uh, our example as a company is, is very far from unique. It applies to many other cement producers and to many other industries at the periphery of the EU. So I hope it will highlight some of the issues that we have already heard about from the previous two panelists. Just a, just a couple of words to introduce my company, Titan Cement. We are a mid-sized building materials company. Uh, many companies of our size uh, around the periphery of Europe. We operate 17 cement plants in 10 countries. Of these, three are in Greece and one is in Bulgaria. We are, of course, fully committed to the European agenda for fighting the climate crisis, including the Fit for 55 targets. And uh, as you said, we, we actually have already our own decarbonization targets. They have been validated by the well-known uh, science-based uh, target initiative. And our performance on these targets is reported transparently to everyone among others, also to the Carbon Disclosure Project, which uh, I'm sure you know and which has recognized us with the leadership status. Just to give you a, an indication of what we're doing, we have already reduced our CO2 footprint. We will reach this year a reduction of 20% versus 1990, and we are accelerating these efforts to achieve our, our objective, which is to reach 500 or below 500 kilos of CO2 per ton cementitious product by 2030. How are we doing this? We're shifting to lower carbon cements. We're implementing low CO2 projects in our manufacturing units. Uh, as we speak, uh, this year we're implementing two major investments, one in a, in a big calciner for energy efficiency in our largest plant in Greece and the new alternative fuels line in our plant in Bulgaria. We are also investing in R&D projects that will take us well beyond 2030. Actually, this, this very week, we are excited to be installing under Aspire collaborative project, a pilot uh, CCU facilities in our plant here near Athens, where we will chemically capture CO2 and convert it to useful chemical additives, grinding aids and other products. Now, unfortunately, as, as we have already heard, while we're investing in this decarbonization, 
we are already experiencing the negative effects of carbon leakage. So carbon leakage is not something we're worried about. Carbon leakage is something that is already happening and is likely to get worse very, very quickly. Specifically, imports to Greece and Bulgaria, I'm putting the two countries together just because of our operations, have increased by more than one and a half times in the last five years. While the exports of our own plants here in these two countries have already dropped by 20% in Greece and are now already zero in Bulgaria. I heard something about exports being supplemented by better uh, you know, coverage through less imports. We are seeing a double effect, less exports, significantly less exports and significantly increased uh, imports at the same time. Clearly, the lost production, both for the EU market and for the export markets we were serving, has shifted primarily to Turkey, which over the same period has tripled its exports to the EU and to some other non-EU countries, which also have no or extremely relaxed CO2 reduction targets. So, so the net effect from an operator perspective is clear. We have a shift from low CO2 emissions in the EU to high CO2 emissions just outside our border, a loss of jobs in the EU and a hit in our ability to invest in growth, to invest in competitiveness and to invest eventually in decarbonization, which is the ultimate goal. Uh, already, uh, several of the speakers before me mentioned some of the conditions that we need to have so that CBAM can help mitigate this problem. CBAM can, can really help. First of all, and, and I, I heard uh, supporting comments from everyone, it must be watertight and not prone to manipulation by non-EU players wishing to take advantage of it. Bear in mind the incentive to bypass it is going to be very big and the fact that it involves emitters placed outside the EU's jurisdiction is, is for me in itself a major undertaking with a substantial risk. Secondly, and I'm glad this is already the core of the discussion of this panel, it must include a solution for exports, which in its present form it does not. Otherwise, exports will simply very soon stop. Third, it must include as many sectors as possible to avoid internal market distortions. Fourth, it must equalize all significant CO2 related costs, not, not just direct emissions. And finally, but perhaps most critically, and again here I've heard the uh, uh, voices supporting that, it should coexist for as long as possible with free allocations to enable a successful and a smooth transition to this new and complex system. Just to give you again some, some figures from, uh, from Greece, where I'm participating from. Last week, the Greek Foundation for Economic and Industrial Research, called IOVE, presented a study of the impact on the Greek economy of a poor CBAM implementation that does not cover the above conditions or, or you know, even, even covers part of these conditions. And it will affect, therefore, negatively our country's industries. The study showed that under a base scenario, during the period of implementation, Greek annual GDP will be reduced by more than 2 billion euro and that 35,000 jobs will be lost. If you get these numbers in the context of the Greek economy and the Greek society, they are significant. And this, as we know, is going to happen, this negative impact, while we will also be increasing the environmental impacts through the carbon leakage. I want to, to make a closing point reacting to, to something that, that I heard before from Mr. Demiko on, on the urgency to find some a solution for experts. Again, I will use Greece as, a, as an indicative example. More than three quarters of the cement production of Greece is exported. All our plants, and I believe several others, are predominantly exporting. A loss of exports will therefore not be economically sustainable even for a short period of time, even for one or two years. Plants which have invested in decarbonization cannot run without this production, and some will have to shut down, impacting the environment, the economy, and jobs. The EU cannot take a wait and see approach to exports. We need a very clear and a robust solution that has to be implemented immediately as soon as the CBAM comes into force. Thank you very much, Elia. These were my opening points.
Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Panaras, for your remarks and also for highlighting the, the case of Greece. Um, I would just like on this note to warmly invite our audience to send us your questions too, as I see that uh, just the first question has appeared in the Q&A's box. Uh, and then turning to Mr. Mensing, um, I would like to uh, perhaps um, uh, ask you a question on uh, uh, on a point that we heard before on the broadening of uh, CBAM scope, as mentioned by both MEPs uh, today, as well as Mr. Panaras uh, just before. So uh, chemicals are currently included too, uh, in addition to the to the sectors covered under the European Commission's proposal. So my question, Mr. Mensing, would be uh, pretty much uh, straightforward, since I wanted to ask you, what are your views on this development and what is your sector's reaction to such inclusion? Thank you, and thank you to Ms. Piraki and, and MEP Chaim as well for uh, for this event. The answer is not now. That's my answer to your question, and I'll explain that in uh, in a second. So first of all, um, I heard the Commission say this was an environmental measure, um, which I partly agree, but it's also a gigantic economic experiment um, with the exports and the European industry. So. Please see it as an environmental measure, but also see it for what it is, which is an economic instrument we haven't used before, which we now will apply in a time where geopolitically everything is changing. And I think that will come into account as well. Mentioned was fertilizer, part of our sector as well, where currently the plans are stopping. Um, and overall, if you look at um, what we're going through in the coming months, a time where we're going to need anything but not retaliation from other trading partners around the world. I think the Commission would agree to that as, uh, as such. If you see it as an ex economic experiment, I think you need to make sure we can do it quickly, decisively, well organized and well um, fitted out. And what I mean by that is the following. If you want to prevent circumvention, and the report of, of MEP Haim um, actually takes a good step there, you need to make sure the member states have the customs officials to check. Um, so part of this lies with the member states, not just having a debate on a central EU authority or not, but who is checking the containers in Rotterdam Harbor? That's the question. If you then include plastics, for example, like in the current proposal, the way it's described covers, I think, 80% of the exports from China and India and containers. Who is going to check is going to be a crucial question. The same, the proposal I saw from, um, from MAP Chaim's report is to include chemicals. That's 1,163 from my head, different chemical products. Again, we're not saying don't do it. We're saying if you do it, make sure you're ready as governments to check all those flows in harbors coming in through the CBOM proposal. And that's where um, this practical feasibility we think can and should be organized in a very careful way. And I've said it on an earlier seminar. We have this saying in Dutch, which is that if you take overtake on a highway, you better look in your mirror to see who comes on the left. You do it with caution. Now, I've said that before the, the war in Ukraine started, I think it's even more accurate right now. And that looking at the council really, really moving fast under the French presidency today would actually, um, maybe um, uh, deserve the comment that it could be wise to come to a compromise as soon as possible also with the parliament get the deal done and stay as close as possible to the commission proposal why am i saying that that is not yet on chemicals as such but that's just overall in the concern we have right now with 300 euros a megawatt hour fertilizer is shutting down they don't need more uncertainty with the dependence we have still on Russian gas and repower EU, I'd rather focus the attention of industry on indeed getting off the Russian gas more than wondering to put the admin systems in place on uh, a still uncertain instrument as, uh, as CBAM. So message number one, um, come to a decision soon and for that reason stay to the original proposal with a limited number of improvements. Where do we see the improvements? Indirect should be in. And I'm very practical there. If you want to outcompete the Chinese, where they are not strong is on the carbon content of their electricity. Their plants in a number of cases could very well be below the emissions of the European plants. If you don't include the indirect already from the beginning, you just give an extra opportunity for the rest of the world to compete with us. So it should be fair and therefore included from the start. 
The second point on circumvention, the more entire value change you can do, the better. And then there's a difference between a bag of fertilizer, which you can label when it comes into a port, or all kinds of flows intermediate in the value chain. Then on exports, um, I very well hear what the Commission is saying. We've also complemented the Parliament's report on recognizing, in many cases, the export issue. I'm not a WTO expert. I just said we don't need retaliation for sure. But there might be a solution which lies in ETS, not in CBAMs. And I'm, again, not being a lawyer, but if you can already differentiate carbon leakage sectors based on carbon intensity and import intensity, then you could also subdivide on export intensity in the way you build down the free allocation over time. Maybe that's where solutions are not necessarily directly on the CBOM tool. And if I hear the commission and I see the hand shaking, you refer as well to this combination of, um, of ETS and CBOM. Now, last but not least on chemicals, um, what we would propose is build a mechanism to include sectors study them carefully, take the right analysis, and then, but don't do that at the start. As I said, the way you can read Mr. Haim's proposal is he says chemicals should be in and the commission should solve it. We read the commission proposal saying we've looked at it, but very carefully, and there's even a specific preamble saying too complex right now. If you want to make a bridge between the two, you would say make a mechanism that's WTO proof, make it so that you don't for every sector need a specific legislative pr procedure, but study subsectors one by one. And if it's safe to overtake to the left lane, then you include them, which currently is not the case with chemicals. Um, especially as for most of these streams, you're not focusing on the countries around Europe, but straight away on the US, which is a region we don't need the retaliation from right now. Now on the economic experiment, and then I'll finalize. The Heim report says, let's draft a report afterwards. By then, your export markets are gone. So you need to prevent this before and not afterwards um, and not risk the export because a little bit more expensive means you lose your market. And we're currently with the energy prices in the coming years going to be very much more expensive than our US colleagues, where you don't need this on, uh, on top. Where there's one proposal in the parliament says, which I really, um, I understand the thinking, but not the practical solution. Let's only help those who are already really good on their export rebates. I don't see that. You're in a benchmark. Only the ones who meet the benchmark get full free allocation. And even that's not the case when it's being built down. So if you then on top, just refocus the export debates again, you've taken a huge economic experiment with our exports, we'll lose the markets. Um, and we don't need that at this moment in time where one of my companies could be quoted yesterday saying, what do you think of this long-term plan? And he said, I'm just busy with one thing, which is surviving the next three months. That's the spirit in industry now. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mensink. And uh, I would like on this note to, um, um, to um, reach out to Mr. Keramidas. Well, Mr. Keramidas, you are the EU and Regulatory Affairs Director at Mitilineos. Uh, a leading global industrial and uh, energy company, and among other tasks in Brussels. Uh, you currently chair the Energy and Climate Change Committee at Eurometo and co-chair the Energy Policy Working Group at Cogent Europe. So from your experience and uh, from your viewpoint, uh, how do you think the proposed CBAM uh, can best support industrial decarbonization? Well, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, thanks to Sam Biro for uh, having me here and uh, Maria Spiraki for putting together this event and hosting it, obviously, uh, and uh, being among this, these esteemed panelists. Let me discuss the CBAM from the perspective of an aluminium producer, of European aluminium producer. So for primary aluminium, under normal conditions worldwide, power represents roughly 40% of the overall production cost. Now, this isn't the case, obviously, in Europe since September of last year. And this is precisely why we've lost 850,000 tons of primary aluminium production, not 650, unfortunately, as Repower EU mentions, since last September. That's roughly 50% of the European output. Now, we hear it's temporary, and I really hope this is the case, but given this is a global market, and during the same period, we're witnessing more than 1.5 million tons of new primary capacity popping up in China, India, the US, Australia, Indonesia, Iran, and Brazil. I would be really surprised 
if we would have the opportunity to bounce back, let's say. Now, bear in mind that this demise comes on top of the undoubtedly permanent loss of 35% of European primary production over the past 20 years. Now, in Europe, we don't call this carbon leakage. We don't even call it investment leakage. We don't admit it destroys our strategic autonomy. Personally, I say call it whatever you want. The fact is, it's really bad for Europe and the climate, by the way, any way you look at it. And reversing this trend should be a priority for policymakers in Brussels and the member states. If we're at all serious about, um, let's say, fixing the climate and the economy. Now, the CBAM is presented. I don't know if we can move on to the next slide. Can you? Um, right. I don't know how that's working for some reason. It doesn't seem to be advancing. And also, Mr. Keramidas, I noticed that um, we just view, at least on uh, on the end of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, we view the presentation as very small on our screen. So perhaps it would be best that we share it on our end, if you if it's also challenging to to, yeah, sure. to the next slide, because sure. I understand ahead. there is an issue there. Yes, please go ahead. All right. Uh, we tested sharing, but we didn't test the advancement. <laughs> it's all right. Well. Um, on slide two, then, uh, the CBAM is presented as a, um, as a climate tool by the Commission. We heard uh, Mr. D'Amico mention it earlier. For a lot of sectors, that this might be the case. For aluminium, it seems unfit for purpose. Now, if one looks closely at figure eight and table eight of the Commission's impact assessment, here we are. The anticipated positive climate impact of the CBAM is negligible, if not questionable. The preferred option is option four, which is phasing out free allowances and keeping the direct compensation plus a CBAM. And that's the only case where this measure vaguely resembles an option worth considering from a climate perspective. And even then, not really for aluminium. I would invite, invite, uh, invite you to advance a little bit. So we see the uh, 0.03 uh, for aluminium. And these simulations, by the way, outline the optimal or rather fictional scenario where circumvention is fully eliminated. So if the CBAM doesn't do the trick, let's move on to slide three, maybe it's a cash cow. But again, looking at figure 18 of the Commission's impact assessment, the actual CBAM revenue could reach 2 billion euros annually. And again, this is the fictitious scenario where no circumvention takes place, right? So the negative annual impact on the Greek GDP alone, I think Yanis mentioned it earlier, in case we scrap CBAM product exports outside the EU, is around 2.1 billion. That's Greece alone. The annual impact. Now, pay attention. The blue bars in this figure do not illustrate CBAM revenues. They provide the impact of removing free allowances on the CBAM sectors. So, if the CBAM is indeed an alternative to existing carbon leakage measures, then this figure, the blue bar figure, is something the CBAM should actually seek to offset. It's just the yellow part that's actually CBAM paid on import. Now, let's move on to the next slide and see how the proposed CBAM may work in practice. On the left, we would have this imaginary scenario where the CBAM gradually replaces existing carbon leakage measures and somehow carbon leakage protection remains intact. If we take our own smelter in Greece and compare it against the smelter in Dubai or Iran, and I'm not even using China, which represents 60% of global production and is basically hooked to coal, right? What would happen if we go on with, uh, let's say, for example, the ENVI proposal? Our annual production cost will increase by a staggering 160 to 170 million euros. That's 850 euros per ton aluminium. Now, the Dubai smelter that has a similar CO2 footprint as ours, actually a bit higher maybe, but I'm, I'm feeling generous today because they, they have oil in their mix as well, but I'm not including that. Let's assume that they have the same footprint as, as we do. So they export roughly 5% of their output in Europe. And that means they incur the CBAM for that part of their production. So if everything works perfectly with the CBAM, their overall additional production cost is 4.5 million euros. That's 23 euros per ton aluminium. So I'm not going to confuse you with the details of the calculation. I just want you to know that those tons entering Europe would bear the same direct emissions costs as our smelter. But despite having the same indirect footprint, these tons would carry only a small fragment of the cost by, borne by our smelter. And that's because of marginal pricing, the way the electricity markets are designed in Europe. And this is where I will beg to differ with uh, Mr. Kopenhauer earlier mentioning that indirect should be included. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. 
So if everything works perfectly with the CBAM, that's the additional cost they will bear, but it gets better. The Dubai smelter can, in line with international standards, first of all, buy carbon offsets for its direct emissions, and secondly, buy guarantees of origin for its indirect emissions. And it can, and it will, spin off the part of its output sent to the EU to ensure a silo calculation of the footprint for tons sent to the EU. Now, the best part is exports. Everybody alluded to that. The, the European Commission and Pasquale mentioned it earlier. You, they explained it can't be solved. So instead of ditching the CBAM, we're going ahead with the CBAM with no solution on exports. Now, this could be a long discussion with literature going back and forth about why an export rebate is in fact inherent to any BCA, but let's say w that's a no-go. So I'll just jump to the numbers. The Dubai smelter sends aluminium to Turkey and Egypt with zero added cost, while we incur an extra 850 euros per tonne. And I ask everyone, how do we compete? How do we stay alive? And even from a climate perspective, forget about the jobs, the competitiveness of the industry. Driving European smelters out of the market now, despite them having half the global average carbon footprint, three times less than China, by the way, and also really, really aggressive decarbonization targets, is insane. It increases the global average carbon intensity of aluminium production. And it also leads to massive dependence. And with the COVID and the gas crisis, we all know where that leads and what it means. So European production is way greener than the global average. And what we should be doing is displacing dirty production by becoming more competitive, not less. That's how you address climate change, even with a, a CBAM or alternatives. The alternatives are uh, uh, the alternative is uh, that going with the CBAM right now, as it's designed, is probably a climate disaster. Now. I have another slide, but I think I've run out of time. So conscious of time, maybe I'll, I'll uh, give some proposals, particular proposals, if we get the chance during the Q&A session, just to uh, allow the debate to go on. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Keramidas. And uh, now I'd like to turn to Ms. Uh, Joanna Lene. Um, thank you very much for being with us today. Uh, to our panel discussion. And just perhaps before that, I would like to let our audience know that we were informed that uh, MEP Mr. Chahim would need to disconnect due to another overlapping commitment. Uh, unfortunately, I'm very sorry for this. Uh, then coming back to, to Ms. Lena, well, uh, currently the EU's uh, CBAM is the world's first internationally applicable border mechanism to put a price to uh, negative environmental impacts. And Following a joint NGO statement in uh, December, E3G, uh, Inter Alia, well, including uh, EEB, Carbon Market Watch, uh, Can Europe as well, uh, WWF, has called for the need towards sensitive and also sensible climate diplomacy while maintaining high ambition levels. So, in order to deliver effectively, uh, we've heard that it's important that CBAM provides real incentives for industries within and outside Europe to reduce their emissions. So what is your take on this? And what would be your uh, your key recommendations? Let's say the top five main messages for policymakers for a fair and effective CBAM, of course, for the larger benefit of climate and environment. Thank you, Ilias. It's great to be part of this discussion. And thank you to some Bureau and the European Parliament, MEP Spiraki, for hosting this. Um, E3G has been following the CBAM process really from the beginning and of course as a climate change think tank we have been focusing on the role it can play as a climate tool as a means of accelerating industry decarbonisation both in Europe and abroad. I was interested um, earlier in, in the comments uh, about the fact that this is really a, a measure that is really focused on you know accelerating industry decarbonisation in third countries that we heard from Mr D'Amico. Um, for us this is very much clearly also linked to the ETS and ensuring that the ETS performs better so it does also have that impact very much domestically as well. Um, but a crucial aspect for us from the start has also been to think about the impact of this tool on international climate politics. So really trying to understand the impact on trade partners, the impact and the risks faced by in particular emerging and developing economies and how that then knocks on and, and affects various aspects of cooperation at an international level on climate action. 
And of course, it's it's fair to say that an EU CBAM was always going to be contentious at the international level, even at the best of times. But the last two years that we've seen in terms of the ge geopolitics and the trade politics backdrop have been obviously particularly difficult. We've had heightened tensions with China. We've had spats over vaccine nationalism in the context of COVID-19. And we have obviously seen a lot of pushback from trade partners over the last year on the fairness, the feasibility and the legality of the EU CBAM measure. Countries like China, Australia, Russia, Russia, but also the United States really pushing back quite openly against the idea. And just on that aspect of fairness that you mentioned, Elias, I think it's also worth saying that there have been really difficult optics internationally around the EU being wealthier, really levying a, a, a charge on manufacturing in industrial sectors, in emerging and developing economies that are struggling at the moment really to recover from COVID-19. And for obvious reasons, uh, Michael mentioned this earlier, you know, the last few weeks have only made this a much more challenging picture with the Russian invasion of Ukraine. We're in a completely new world. Uh, the space for cooperation and goodwill at the international level on climate has narrowed. Uh, we are in a context where carbon pricing and the issue of fossil fuel pricing in industry sectors has only increased in salience and increased in terms of the political challenges that surrounds that. Um, energy intensive sectors in Europe and abroad are under pressure. We've heard this from a couple of speakers, but it's also clear now more than ever that we have to actually accelerate industrial decarbonisation and ensure that we get off and reduce that dependency on gas imports and fossil fuel imports. Um, at the same time, in this in this crisis, we're seeing trade policy being leveraged as an economic weapon with good reason but that weaponization of trade policy is also something that plays into and is quite difficult in the EU CBAM in terms of international politics I think the risk of retaliation in this context we always thought of Russia as a key country that would be concerned about the EU CBAM only it goes up so it really just re-emphasizes that this is a difficult time for this internationally and finally on the point of fairness again I mean we're seeing more than ever that with developing and emerging economies they are facing really difficult issues around commodity price shocks, not least around fertilizer um, and agricultural products. Um, again, this just reinforces the need that now more than ever, we really need to get the international politics of the EU CBAM right. And for us, this really rests on three key pillars. Um, there's the strong legal case that has to be made where we've already heard a lot from the Commission and other speakers on this, what this means in terms of export rebates and the limitation on that, but also what this means in terms of um, a free allocation phase out, the, the really ensuring that we get that overlap, the risk of double protection right there. Uh, the second key pillar is really active, an active diplomacy strategy. And this is one where we've maybe not seen enough so far from the EU, from member states, from the Commission, on this so far. It's really essential that we are consulting with trade partners throughout this, regularly updating and sharing information with them, and as much as possible, trying to really seek to build coalitions with like-minded countries. By now, we're in an interesting situation where you have the US, Japan, Canada, and the UK all exploring implementing similar measures. We really have to think about how these measures work in accordance with each other, what coalitions, what common methodologies can be used and leveraged here that can really be transformative. Um, and finally, I would say the final pillar, which for us is really crucial and has been missing to date, is that we need a parallel cooperative offer. So we've heard from a number of speakers that, you know, the ultimate objective of the EU CBAM is to accelerate um, climate action to accelerate industrial decarbonisation in third countries. What the CBAM does is it creates a, a stick in doing that, but it doesn't create the carrot. It doesn't actually have that broader cooperative offer. It doesn't allow for that financial and technical support that will really accelerate industrial decarbonisation of heavy industries abroad. And for us, this is really essential in terms of getting the international politics of this right. This plays into, of course, questions of what we can do with the use of revenues. Um, it plays into questions of what we tr do in terms of the treatment of LDCs. Um, and uh, beyond the kind of CBAM proposal itself, there is a question of what other platforms and packages can be introduced to really support that cooperative offer. And this is where, for us, the German proposal to create an open and inclusive climate club as part of its G7 presidency um, becomes very interesting alongside the EU CBAM. Um, of course, if we just look uh, in terms of closing, I'll just look briefly at where we are in the negotiations. We have a lot of elements of these three kind of pillars that I outlined are in um, MEP Shaheen's report. Elements around revenue recycling and thinking about LDCs are sort of reinforced there. 
in terms of the council decision that we expect to be adopted today, I'd say we're still missing quite a lot, um, especially because the sort of ultimate challenges around agreeing on an ambitious free allocation phase out are not going to be decided on in this decision today, probably. And the agreement on the table also is likely to not really provide any support for developing countries and LDCs and avoids the question of revenue use. So a lot that needs to still be um, shored up if we're going to get the international politics of this right. And we'd really emphasize that for us, basically, a CBAM doesn't cannot exist without that international dimension around climate diplomacy really being part of the package and the discussion here. But look forward to questions and the debate. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lena, for uh, highlighting the international angles, uh, very much linked with uh, with, uh, with this discussion today on CBAM. And I understand also that this is uh, something very important for Mr. Chahim as well, that he wants CBAM to serve as an instrument that incentivizes cooperation rather than, of course, uh, confrontation with the union's partners. So thank you very much for, uh, for making this point. And then coming back to uh, Mr. Davis, uh, I think you're the speaker that uh, we so far haven't heard from. So uh, welcome on board uh, in this discussion. And well, it is clear that uh, in the decade ahead, we must pave the way to make heavy industries uh, climate neutral by 2050. And as the future mechanism needs to secure uh, benefits for the EU climate policy, it is equally important to do so, of course, for the workers of the EU industry. So could you please give us your perspective on this and also your thoughts uh, with regards to CBAMs, both uh, design, but equally implementation too. Thank you, um, Ilias, and um, good morning to, to all of you. Thank you, um, Madam Spiraki, for hosting this uh, really important uh, event uh, on a, a topic which is indeed um, uh, extremely important for, for trade unions and uh, the workers that we represent. And let me maybe start uh, just by uh, throwing a, a few numbers. Uh, in terms of, of jobs, uh, energy intensive industries in Europe um, offer uh, 8 million of, of jobs, um, 8 million of men and women working in uh, energy intensive industries. And those industries are also extremely important for a series of sectors uh, downstream the value chains. I could mention a series of uh, manufacturing industries in the sectors that we represent as industrial Europe, such as automotive, but we could also refer to construction or, or transport. Um, and we believe that uh, beyond employment and, and welfare, um, industry also matters from a geopolitical perspective. It's absolutely crucial nowadays that um, uh, we need uh, the key conditions to be to be there, to be in place, to build our open strategic autonomy in, in the EU. And uh, we believe that um, CBAM has a role to play. Uh, CBAM is not the panacea, but has a role to play in that effort to build a strong uh, EU industry while decarbonizing uh, its uh, its uh, or, or industries. Uh, we believe that um, uh, CBAM must first and foremost uh, equalize the CO2 cost. CBAM is there to uh, level the playing field between EU uh, industrial domestic producers and their main competitors on EU and, and global markets. Having said that, we still believe that uh, the CBAM must be in line with um, uh, multilateral, multilateral trade rules and trade uh, agreements. Uh, we don't want to build a, a wall between uh, Europe and other regions in the world. Uh, starting with, of course, the neighboring regions. We have uh, members in a series of um, uh, non-EU European countries. And uh, we, of course, want to continue to build economic uh, relationships and, and solidarity with, uh, with them. So um, what kind of CBAM uh, do, we, do we want as um, uh, the Euro European Trade Union Federation representing uh, workers in industry? First, uh, we want uh, a CBAM that will strengthen, complement, but not weaken the existing framework to deal with uh, carbon leakage. And for us, it's absolutely key to be cautious in the way we will shift from the existing system 
um, limiting the risk of carbon leakage to the implementation of the CBAM. We first want the CBAM to be implemented, to be assessed before deciding on the pace and the working arrangements of the free allocation phase out. Uh, then we want, as many other speakers said, a solution to deal with exports. Um, we believe that exports require a solution right now. We need an answer um, right now to the problems that have been raised so far. We cannot wait until uh, the end of 2026 to um, uh, possibly have uh, eventually a, a report that will uh, list a series of, of recommendations. Electricity uh, and indirect emissions uh, must be uh, under the scope of the CBAM from our perspective, even though some uh, implementing uh, details uh, will uh, require um, further discussions, as, as already said by, um, by uh, the, the speaker representing the aluminium industry. Um, but it's absolutely obvious for us that given the role that electricity will play in decarbonizing electro-intensive industries, uh, either through direct electrification or through power to X uh, or, or hydrogen, uh, it's absolutely crucial to uh, include the, the scope two uh, emissions in the in the scope of, of the CBAM. Um, in terms of um, downstream sectors, this is a bit missing for the moment in the discussion. And uh, from the beginning, we have said we shouldn't end up in a system that might indeed uh, protect uh, energy intensive industries in Europe while um, not paying attention to uh, the, the sectors downstream, the, the value chain. Because if we end up in a system where uh, we uh, kind of import uh, all the or a significant part of um, the manufacturing uh, goods um, um, being made of um, um, steel, aluminium, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, it will not be, of course, a, a, a good a good solution for for us. We need to include downstream sectors at least in the Article 30, the, the review of the of the CBAM, to closely monitor what is uh, what will be the the impact of of CBAM in those in those sectors. In terms of use of revenues, I tend to share with what Mr. Uh, Demico said from from the Commission, um, meaning that the CBAM is and must be uh, first a climate policy instrument. But if this is the case, and if CBAM is not a cash cow for the EU budget, how to explain that CBAM has been identified as one of the three possible new sources of revenues for the EU budget in the communication published by the Commission a few weeks ago? on uh, possible new own resources for the EU budget. This is something I do not understand and I uh, would like to, to, um, to hear the, the Commission views on that, because from our perspective, the key priorities in terms of use of revenues must be to finance the CBAM administration. Uh, there are a lot of costs uh, that are related to the CBAM implementation. So first, uh, CBAM revenues must be used to cover those costs. Then if uh, we have um, um, uh, additional revenues, those revenues must be used to uh, accelerate and, and boost uh, innovation in the sectors covered by, uh, by the CBAM. And it's not uh, in contradiction with what uh, the previous speaker just said on the need maybe to also boost and increase the support provided by the EU to least developed countries when it comes to uh, just transition and, and decarbonization of their uh, industries. Um, I would like maybe to uh, briefly um, mention the fact that for us, um, CBAM and more generally the support provided to uh, companies in their efforts to decarbonize must be made conditional to uh, strong commitments to uh, create, maintain quality jobs in Europe, commitments to invest in uh, industrial sites and, and plants, uh, and um, it must be also uh, conditional to um, 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 higher transparency when it comes to, for instance, the uh, real uh, electricity cost paid by companies through PPAs, 
the state aid receives to compensate indirect costs. Uh, we believe that uh, all those issues must be part of the discussion. The aim here is not to give a series of blank checks uh, to industries that might lead to undue windfall profits. Uh, we agree with the fact that uh, public support is there to incentivize uh, companies to invest, but we also want those companies that receive public support uh, to um, uh, to, to make uh, strong commitments uh, to, to see how that money received will be translated uh, in the benefits of, uh, of the society as a well. whole. So this is in a nutshell uh, how we see the debate as, as trade unions. Yes to a CBAM um, with all the, the conditions that I, that I mentioned and we want the CBAM to be conditional to strong commitments uh, that it will uh, lead to an industry keeping and maintaining quality jobs in EU while decarbonizing. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Dennis, for your uh, for your remarks. And well, I would have to say that although I noticed that we have more than 205 participants uh, connected uh, during this event, they seem to be rather uh, hesitant uh, to post their questions. Uh, so, or well, perhaps our excellent set of speakers for today has uh, perhaps provided responses to all the possible angles. Um, so, just on this note, I'm uh, very happy uh, to have welcomed you all uh, during this panel discussion. And perhaps I can just uh, pose one or two questions myself uh, as a moderator. And specifically, I think it would be very interesting to hear uh, what our speakers' views as well uh, regarding indirect emissions coverage too uh, within CBAM. And perhaps we can start with uh, uh, with the Commission. Uh, as I was uh, wondering, is there any methodology uh, in place to measure and calculate this at this stage? Okay, thank you so much for the question. I have invited Yanis Zachariadis, uh, who's part of the CBAM team, and uh, he's in charge with this uh, methodology, methodology and the indirect emission aspects. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, and thank you very much. Um, well, the, the reason why we have not included indirect emissions from the outset is because of the of the deep of the methodological difficulties um, um, embedded in, in in devising an appropriate methodology to do so. And the, the, there are two two elements to that. One is um, how you calculate the indirect emissions and whether you're, whether you're 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 simply using a default value to calculate the uh, the indirect emission and 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 and, and if not. Uh, how can you give uh, uh, um, uh, flexibilities for uh, for producers to uh, uh, to demonstrate um, uh, actual emissions from consumed uh, uh, electricity? So that's one complication that needs to be addressed. And the second one would be, and most critical one would be that you know if indirect emissions are included, then their inclusion will need to be calibrated in order to address the uh, the phasing out or the 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 the, the Abolition of, of state aid uh, uh, in in the, in the sectors that are uh, uh, receiving uh, state aid from indirect cost compensation uh, 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 from the cost pressures from uh, from electricity costs. So uh, these two elements are, are are indeed very very complex. So and this is the reason why we we still do not have have not uh, uh, devised a specific uh, methodology uh, in order to uh, to include the indirect emissions. Uh, uh, from the outset. However, this is the reason why we also allow for uh, the reporting of indirect emissions during the transitional period for us to collect data and allow for some time uh, during the first three years from the introduction of CBAM to collect the data in order to do additional analysis uh, on these two specific elements that I just mentioned so that we can see uh, how how indirect emissions can be effectively introduced and uh, introduced and included in the in the possible ex extension of the scope of the auto mechanism. You want I can take the other questions I heard. So uh, on the extension to uh, chemicals, where is something that uh, also uh, Yanis can tackle. So uh, please understand that what we have put in CBAM complies with certain criteria, including the feasibility. This is one of the most important. And if you look, if you look into the recitals, you see why certain products have been excluded so far. For example, certain chemical products or certain refineries products. So here we don't have the set of data that we need. Remember that CBAM is an experimental system, and that we need to finalize methodology. Without this methodology, it's difficult to capture all the products. There will be a request for enlargement of products from the council, 
This you will see probably today. But this request is always falling in the same sectors that are there. So if the parliament wants to enlarge to other sectors like MEP Shaim is doing, we can look into that, but it may be more complicated. And the other questions, uh, Denis, uh, Mr. Benjamin Denis uh, asked why we have SIBAM in own resources when it is not conceived to raise money. Of course, because it is a behavioral regulatory system, like you have behavioral taxes and taxes on tobacco. We don't want you to smoke, we tax tobacco. So here in SIBAM, we are trying to have a behavioral change in third countries. But the problem is that we cannot quantify the amount of money that will come because the more countries will be uh, will abide by our uh, request and by the Paris Agreement, the more they decarbonize, the less adjustment they will pay. And that's why we have a problem here in supporting and founding a centralized authority. Uh, similarly, the, the proposal from uh, Mrs. Lane about uh, feeding uh, LDC uh, decarbonization plants with these resources is untenable because we don't know how much money will come. And please look also at what happened in the context of the vote in other committees, apart from MV, on this proposal. So this is something that you should look at uh, also from the, the, the political traction in the European Parliament. But this is, not, this is for you, it's not for us. Other questions on circumvention and downstream products. We are extremely uh, careful on that because we don't want the system to be abused and to be circumvented. There were extremely intelligent and, uh, and good proposals coming from, from, from INTA. Unfortunately, the opinion fell down. Similar proposals and they have been filed to MV as well. So we are expecting a similar proposal to come and we are looking to that with a very uh, positive views. Short term versus long term. This is something that was accessed still by uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Pagnari. Yes, this is exactly the problem of SIBAM. SIBAM is a long term measure. It's not a short term measure. Anti dumping you can have in force in 15 months. We are talking 15 years. In 15 years, if you are Canadian, we may be all dead, but we may all change and reform our uh, structure of production and to introduce clean, uh, clean system and clean uh, manufacturing uh, system. Again, on export solutions, you say we don't come with the revol revolutionary solutions, while a lot of ideas are circulating in the European Parliament. I'm looking at all of them with the utmost interest and not only me, but the whole team of legal experts that is looking into them. For example, there is a proposal on taking free allowances only on exported products. Again, I cannot go into the legal details because this would impair our defense in the WTO. But please remember that any proposal that is distinguishing import from export and that is making a contin a subsidies contingent in law or in fact to export risk to be in violation of our WTO commitments. So this is something we cannot look at. But at the same time, I'm not coming here to say there is no solution for export. There are many possible solutions and we are open to look at them together with you. One of the possible solutions is to look into green subsidies. Other solutions is working in appropriate way with the trajectories of phasing in and phasing out. And here again, there is a proposal for an evaluation, an exempt evaluation of the CBAM before having CBAM into force. Please understand that if we do another exempt evaluation, like the one made in the impact assessment by the gentleman here on my right, we are simply doubling what we have already analyzed. What we need to have is to have SIBAM in force before saying if a SIBAM works. And we cannot have SIBAM in force without getting rid of free allowances. So said, we have a principle and the principle is stated in SIBAM for which we can decide how much of SIBAM goes into force according to how much we remove of free allowances. And into this context, yes, we can have an evaluation at some point and we are ready to do that. I think I replied to the most part of questions I had, but if there are others, we are more than happy to, to reply. And I don't know if uh, Yanis wants to add. No, no, just, just one minor thing, uh, not to take more of your time, but on, on the point of the extension of the scope to more products and, and, and in the issue of chemicals. Um, uh, what is important to note is that, you know, we, the products that we have proposed to include it, CBAMON, have been proposed under a set of particular criteria. That there should be a risk of carbon leakage, which means that they are, their, their trade intensity and their uh, and and their emission intensity is high, and 
that their emission should be relevant in the sense that they, there should be high emitters and that the, there is that the technical um, feasibility of including those sectors is uh, that there is a technical feasibility of including those sectors and the the, um, the sectors that we have selected are are simple enough if I, if I can if I can call in that in the sense of uh, we are it is possible to translate for those sectors the benchmarks applicable in the ETS and to translate those from installation level to project level. We know that we can do this. It is something that we are working on in, in laying out the specific detailed rules to do so. But for these sectors, uh, we're quite confident that we can do it. For other, sec for other sectors, also within the frame of, of the ETS, indeed it is possible, but the technical feasibility of doing so is much more complex. And this is why we have not, uh, we have not um, included them yet. Thank you very much to both. And if I may just uh, uh, come back with uh, a follow-up question for um, uh, for Mr. D'Amico. Well, uh, this comes from Mr. Paolo Falcioni, uh, DG for Aplia Home Appliance Europe. Um, so, Mr. Uh, D'Amico, uh, you've mentioned that it will be important to ensure competitiveness uh, for uh, our industries uh, in Europe. Uh, what about predictability for all downstream users as well uh, of raw materials subject to CBAM? And then there is a second question uh, very much linked with this comment uh, slash question. Well, for Ms. Piraki as well. And uh, this is, uh, again, on the downstream industries, uh, like the one that uh, Mr. Falcone represents, uh, that will become non-competitive uh, when raw materials in Europe will be more expensive than the same raw materials outside EU. Uh, so perhaps we can start with Mr. D'Amico, uh, followed by Ms. Piraki. Yeah, it's, a, it's a very good question. So first of all, on downstream products, what we have done so far was enlarging our product scope to downstream products. If you look at steel, that's the reason why we have added the product under Chapter 73, the tubes, for example. They are not steel products, but they are made of steel. Now, there is the risk that there will be a circumvention through downstream products, and this is tackled by Article 27 in CBAM. And the Parliament, this, uh, this was a good work of, uh, of uh, INTA and this good work in, in MV now, is trying to strengthen the system of anti-circumvention taking into account also other possible solutions that we will look at with, with very open, open mind. Now, uh, the problem of raw materials and the prices, please understand that CBAM does not work alone. CBAM works with ETS. So if we have an increase of price, the increase of price will be primarily determined by the UETS. And that's why the honorable member, members of the parliament here present, they have a very important role because they work on both proposals while we are working only on this uh, on this one. And this one is not the target uh, of your problems. The problems you have are more on the other side because you say you don't want to, to lose the free allowances. This is something for the UETS. CBAM is just offering you a solution for the moment where these free allowances will be removed. Then you can decide when and how you can take into account the terrible so uh, situation that is, uh, is arising because of the, of the war in, uh, in Ukraine. CBAM is just mirroring that situation, and we can discuss on how to do with that. We are very open on that. You want to add anything? No, no, no. Thank you. Perhaps, Ms. Piraki, if you'd like to step in on this question as well. Ah, I think you are muted. I'm sorry. Is it okay now? Yes. And if it, it is the last question, if I may conclude with this? Yes, yes, of course. Well, I have been fully covered by, by the answer on, on the representative of the commission looking on the issue of the, of the downstream companies because it is something much more complicated than giving an answer in the framework of SIBAM. It, uh, 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 it is dependent on the cost, on the energy cost. It is also dependent on the policies that uh, it is uh, applying on, on the issue of reusing and uh, uh, recycling materials. And uh, a, a lot of issues are involved in, in, in this regard. But it is also important that we are trying in the framework of ETS and CBAM to strengthen the, the system in order to support the downstream companies. And by saying this, I would like just to, to, to give uh, to our audience some important takeaways from this very 
allow me to say, fruitful uh, exchange of views in the framework of SIBOM uh, uh, and the competitiveness of our industry, and also, of course, on the on the way that we are trying to address our uh, environmental scope, which is which is our main priority. To start with, the 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 SOS issue, according to my opinion, is how shall we finally establish a carbon price mechanism for the third countries. And uh, uh, the Commission has already mentioned that there are a lot of interest when it comes to similar systems to provide support, but it is important to provide technical support for the countries interested in order to work on, on, on creating a level playing field with third countries. I think this is the, the number one step that we have to work upon. It is also important that we have the clarification coming from the Commission and from our Greek colleague, Yanis Zachariadis, but uh, there are a lot of technical obstacles in order to include the indirect emissions in the simple mechan mechanism, which was one of the of the main issues that the, 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 the industry put on the table. When it comes to the expansion of the scope, I fully agree with the approach coming from from the part of the of the industry in this in particular from the chemical industry and i have also said it in in my introduction but it is important to stick on the on the proposal coming from the commission it is important because there are a lot of concerns raising uh, and not coming only from the chemical industry but also from the other sectors in order to understand the capacity of member states to to the inputs, uh, to, 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 to control the inputs, to check the inputs, and it is a key issue to address before we proceed with the expansion of the scope. And, of course, it is important to find an important compromise when it comes to the issue of exports. I think this is the key discussion for SIBAM. On the issue of export, frankly speaking, I think that we have to withdraw from the table the, the discussion concerning the exports debate, because it is it is obvious that it's not compatible with the WTO me mechanism and regulation. But it is important to stick on, on different solutions in order to have maybe a compared solution, a solution which will complement other measures. And of course, it was also important to work on, on green subsidies, on innovation fund, and uh, finally find the solution that it will it will facilitate our exports and it will also keep the, the level of, uh, of exports that we have now maintain this issue. And the allocation of allowances is not the last, but uh, it is important that we have not to, to, to maintain them uh, too long but for a period needed in order to accelerate the decarbonization of our industry. I would like to conclude by saying this. We are not trying to create a mechanism that would will finally lead to undermining the competitiveness of our industry. But it is important to create a mechanism that it will facilitate the global level of plate field in the sector included. It is also important to understand that we have a lot of financial instruments at this period of time to facilitate and accelerate the transition of our of our industry in order to become green and, and digital. And in this regard, I would like just to mention the, the, the state aid the guidelines that they are on pipeline and also the new toolkit that the Commission has already published last week. Thank you very much once again for your participation. I think that it was a very useful and fruitful discussion. Thank you very much for your time and uh, looking forward to, to, to cooperating with you in, in other aspects. Thank may, you I, very much. may I also interject now, uh, Mrs. Spiraki, to thank you for your um, organization for this event and all the speakers for uh, being present today. Um, I think we have learned a lot today as well on the state of affairs. And maybe if I can just mention two issues that have been raised in the debate. I mean, the indirect, uh, which was indeed mentioned by the European Commission, I think it is very important to include them into the CBAM um, uh, scope. Uh, and I think the reason why is what I mentioned before. If you're looking at carbon capture projects, we will use between 50 and 120 percent more electricity. So I think that's important to take into account. We will need more electricity. I hear the aluminium sector. But I do think that the European Commission over the past days has made an opening to look into the marginal price setting into the European Union, into the market integration system. So I think that's something that we need to look at together. On the exports, I also hear the Commission, I hear the red line of the Commission. 
Um, on both exports and imports, I fully agree with the Commission that legal certainty and predictability is an important issue, and we will indeed abide by that. Um, but I do welcome the fact that the Commission is indeed referring to legal opinions within the Commission. We will be happy to sit around the table and to, to look at that together. Um, so far, we've not heard too much about the counter-arguments to ours. I'm happy to say that to see that the chief legal uh, analysts of the European Commission are involved in this. Um, I hope that we also have people who know a little bit about WTO and, and happy to uh, sit around the table on this, because we do think that on export, there can be a solution found um, because, after all, it's looking at a regulatory measure that needs to be calibrated, uh, both for uh, national production or production in the EU and for export. So we do think that there is a solution there possible. Linking the innovation fund to exports uh, is an idea, but the question is how do you put that forward without discriminating between sectors uh, on the one hand. And secondly, it's not really a substitute for a export regime. So we would hope that there is also a solution possible um, in another way, which is indeed WTO uh, compatible. So I would like to just give these two points as important points uh, in closing the discussion. But thank you again, all the speakers, and thank you, Mr. Spiraki, for hosting the event. Thank you very much, Mr. Kopenhol, and of course, Ms. Piraki as well. Uh, I'm very happy that on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, we have covered as many angles as possible, and probably such key topic would require plenty more hours. But as Ms. Piraki highlighted, it's uh, very important to have this uh, debate today for an ambitious and effective CBAM that is able to deliver both on its vision, but also feasibility of implementation, as Ms. Piraki stressed. So, Ms. Piraki, thank you very much for your key takeaways and for hosting this event under the umbrella of the Intergroup. Uh, to Mr. Copenhagen and Sembiro colleagues for kindly co-organizing, and of course, a warm thanks goes out to all the speakers, but uh, participants as well, of this discussion uh, with regards to addressing the CBAM proposal. And as we are wrapping up today's uh, event, I would like to uh, let you know that on behalf of the Secretariat of the Intergroup, we're very much looking forward to continuing the dialogue in the future. And then, until then, uh, stay safe, all the best, and should condition allow hopefully we'll uh, also be able to soon exchange in person uh, thank you very much to all thank you yes. thank you thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you very much thank you bye bye